All right, thank you everybody for uh, for joining us today. Um, I am in just uh, one minute gonna hand the floor over to uh, Joanne Kilgore. Um, she will introduce our panelists. We know everybody is very busy. There's a lot going on. So thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules to, to, um, to join us today um, to talk about the o Ohio River Valley Institute's um, new report on the regional greenhouse gas initiative and how it can deliver opportunities um, for coal plant communities uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, a couple of uh, quick items, uh, admin items before I hand it over to Joanne. Um, you can ask questions um, by typing in your question in the, in the Q&A um, uh, dialogue box. Um, it would be great also if you're a reporter and you're asking your question to let us know what outlet you're from, or where you're from, um, uh, that would be really helpful. So you can do that at any time. When we get to the end of the, uh, the presentation, Joanne will manage a, a Q&A and, and hand those questions off to our speakers as applicable. Uh, another reminder you probably heard, but we are recording. We are live on Facebook. We'll have a link to the recording for folks afterwards too, to make sure that you um, have access to that. Um, so I want to make sure that Joanne, uh, are you are you there? <laughs> there? You are there. Okay, I was doing a little filibustering there, um, just in case. Um, so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna hand I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Joanne Kilgore, who's the executive Dir director of the Ohio River, Ohio River Valley Institute, and she'll introduce our speakers. Joanne, thanks so much, John, um, and thanks everyone for being here with us this morning for the release of our report options and opportunities for coal plant communities, Pennsylvania, and the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Since it began in January of 2009, Reggie states have cut carbon pollution from their electric power plants by more than half, removed tons of dangerous pollutants from the air, invested more than $3 billion in Reggie generated funding into their state economies, and created tens of thousands of new jobs. Reggie currently includes 11 states from Maine to Virginia and is the nation's first and largest market-based program to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Pennsylvania could become the next state to join Reggie and a final ruling from the Environmental Quality Board is expected next month. Governor Wolf and some state lawmakers have proposed that a significant portion of Reggie proceeds, which are estimated to be $300 million in the first year alone be placed in an energy communities trust fund, some of which would targets investments toward coal communities. The report we're releasing today examines how Pennsylvania's participation in REGI could support economic development and job creation, particularly in coal communities most impacted by the energy market transition away from coal to other more cost competitive energy sources. By examining case studies of coal-fired power plant closures in New York, Massachusetts, Colorado, and Washington, this report provides lessons for Pennsylvania in helping to sustain and strengthen local communities. This is the first analysis of its kind to draw from the experience of these other states and help inform decision-making here in the Commonwealth. The report demonstrates that Pennsylvania faces two fundamental options reject Reggi and allow market forces to determine when and if the last Pennsylvania coal-fired generating units at coal power plants will close with little or no help from existing owners or available local and regional funding sources to cushion the impact, or adopt Reggi and use a significant portion of new Reggi funding to assist coal plant workers and coal communities and their local economies to generate a more prosperous future and create jobs. I'm now pleased to introduce the author of the report, Joseph Cullen, to provide more insight into these findings. Joe. Thanks, Joanne, and uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, look forward to um, question and answers on the report. That'll be most of uh, the time in our presentation. Um, but I just want to do a super high level overview, maybe the seven to 10 minute um, spin through the report and um, many thanks for the to the folks at the uh, Ohio R River Valley Institute for um, their expertise and assistance on putting this report together. 
So uh, I think everyone is familiar with the Reggie story. So I'll just in super um, brief highlights, um, October of 2019, Governor Wolf signed an executive order to uh, propose the idea. And in November of 2020, um, the CO2 budget trading program regulation was published in the Pennsylvania Bulletin. And since then, that's been tracking uh, the procedures laid out in the Pennsylvania Air Pollution Control Act. And I could go through all those, but it would be time consuming, but it's gone through the process in July 13th. Um, it's on the agenda for the Environmental Quality Board to uh, approve or disapprove of the uh, proposed regulation. And if it is approved, Pennsylvania could join Reggie by January 2022, uh, so uh, January next year. So uh, one of the things the report does is it lays out, so what are the national market trends in energy? And one of the things that um, I think is clear across the country is there's a trend away from coal uh, to natural gas, wind and solar and other less expensive um, uh, forms of uh, energy production. A uh, recent academic study has uh, concluded that the all-in cost, which is the economic term uh, for coal is more than double the cost of um, solar and wind and nearly double the cost of natural gas. So faced with these market forces, um, it's not a shock that uh, coal powered electricity share in Pennsylvania has dropped as it has nationally. And um, the report has some graphics. Uh, it's dropped from 57% in uh, 2001 to 47% in uh, 2010. Um, 17% in uh, 2019, and then 16% uh, just uh, this past January. So the projections are that um, it'll drop to 4% by 2030 uh, with or without Reggie. Um, the report has uh, uh, details in Appendix A and B of uh, which coal sites have uh, closed and uh, which have been decommissioned and um, any that have announced plans to uh, make a transition to natural gas or other sources. So um, the uh, so so one of the things that got this uh, report started uh, was when you take a look at the uh, comments that were filed in January 2021. There were approximately 14,000 comments um, filed on the rulemaking, and in general, um, there they were favorable by about a seven to one ratio. And one of the surprising things when you look at some of the details of the comments are the number of business groups that support uh, Reggie. So uh, there's a coalition called Reggie for PEA, uh, which employs 68,000 employees in Pennsylvania, including universities and energy companies, uh, enthusiastically support uh, Reggie. And then some of the big energy names like Royal Dutch Shell, BP, and Exelon they're also um, supporting Reggie. So one of the energy companies that owns um, two coal plants in Pennsylvania uh, put it this way in their comments. And that said, uh, with or without Reggie, Pennsylvania coal plants will be challenged and face an uncertain future. With Reggie, however, funds are available to ease the transition and provide opportunities for the, uh, for the future without having to impact uh, the taxpayer. So with that kind of stark choice with or without Reggie by one of the leading energy companies in Pennsylvania that owns coal, two coal, uh, coal, coal plants, um, it raises a question. So um, what are Reggie states doing with Reggie proceeds when it comes to coal plant communities? Um, and that was the genesis of the um, beginning of the report. Super high level uh, summary right now, there are six coal plants that are operating in Pennsylvania. One of them on June 9th, since the beginning of writing this report, Cheswick, uh, Genon announced that they'd be closing on September 15th. Uh, two of the um, um, uh, coal plants, uh, Brunner Island and Montour are owned by uh, Talon Energy. The, they've already announced plans to change the natural gas in 2025 um, uh, at uh, Montour and uh, 2028 at Brunner Island. Um, so we have three coal plants uh, that have not announced any plans, Kahnemaw, uh, Homer City, and Keystone. 
and they represent approximately, according to their comments, 600 jobs and uh, $3.7 million in annual local taxes. So when we look at, um, uh, you know, Reggie Inc. puts out very transparent reports, uh, very helpful. Joanne kind of made a reference there. Uh, since it began in January 20, uh, 2009, and since then, Reggie states have cut carbon by half, um, invested more than $3 billion in Reggie-generated funds into their state economies and created tens of thousands of jobs. The idea behind uh, this study was to drill down and take a look at, uh, so what's happening at some of these coal plant community sites where coal plants have closed? Uh, has Reggie funding been deployed? And what's been the impact and can we learn anything and have any takeaways from what's happened in other places and what lessons can we learn? So the report lays out um, eight case studies, uh, four from New York, um, uh, one uh, quick review of their statute uh, in New York to specifically assist coal plant sites. Um, but we have uh, Dunkirk, New York, which is in Dunkirk, um, uh, uh, New York. It's an NRG, um, a former NRG facility, Huntley Generation in um, uh, Tonawanda, New York, uh, Cuyahoga Power, which is in Lansing, New York, and Somerset uh, Operating um, Company in Barker, New York. So those are the four um, New York coal plant case studies. And then followed in New York, of course, is a uh, Reggie state and has used Reggie funding uh, at each of those sites. Uh, and then we have two case studies from Massachusetts, uh, the Salem Harbor uh, Power Station in Salem, Massachusetts and Brayton Point in um, Somerset, Massachusetts. Um, and again, a uh, different process in New York or uh, Massachusetts from New York, but Reggie funding has been deployed at each of those sites. And then uh, very quickly, because Colorado uh, has a statewide commission um, that has a lot of stakeholders involved, in including the AFL-CIO uh, state chair um, to plan out and make recommendations on coal plant uh, transition. Um, we uh, highlight that as a, uh, one of the case studies. And then Sean, in just a little bit, will talk um, in more detail about uh, Transalta Centralia, which is a Washington state. It's the last coal plant in Washington state and uh, very exciting best practices from there. So um, what can I say uh, in general about what we found? Uh, and again, we're happy to discuss all of this in detail. Um, one, of the, one of the things is, you know, just to note, none of these communities chose to go through the wrenching experience and the economic distress caused by um, the coal plant closure. Um, so uh, you, you won't find that any of these case studies, people say, yeah, we volunteered for this role, uh, but the case studies do describe in some detail um, how they dealt with the situation they were handed. And what we found is there really are no quick and easy solutions to, uh, to coal plant clo closures. And uh, Reggie funding is certainly not a panacea. Um, however, um, what we found is Reggie funding um, really did play a critical role at all the sites. Although the scenarios played out differently, the Reggie funding um, was deployed in uh, different ways. Um, so uh, some of the common features that we found in all the case studies uh, and ways that Reggie funding can be most uh, impactfully uh, deployed uh, include um, the uh, when a coal plant closes, uh, you, you immediately have lost tax revenues. So local governments are faced with the somewhat awful choice of uh, laying off first um, first responders or teachers, or they've got to balance the budget while um, losing um, a, a source of revenue that oftentimes has been in the community for decades. Um, so one of the things that Reggie funds have been used for, certainly in all six of the case studies from New York and Massachusetts, is buying some time uh, for um, local governments, uh, not just to respond to the, con um, the crisis, but also um, begin to prepare the reinvestment and site reuse 
um, program. So loss of tax res revenues, uh, it's a big uh, function of reggie funds and the statute in New York that's in the report uh, addresses that specifically. Um, a second thing that comes up at every uh, site is, um, so how do you prepare the, uh, the site to attract um, new investments and new jobs uh, for coal plant workers, hopefully at the same uh, wages? So Reggie funds have been used for site retrofits, um, demolition and cleanups, uh, the demands and needs are different uh, in, uh, at every site. Um, uh, the third area that they've been used for are uh, uh, project development and seed funding. So what, uh, what we've seen in the six um, case studies is uh, oftentimes a local community will need um, not just to redevelop the site, but have uh, sources of um, seed money for new investments. Uh, some of those come from private sources, uh, but also local government needs to often kick in um, seed funding as well. And so Reggie funds have been uh, used to do that. And perhaps most importantly, um, the fourth category is uh, job training and job placement for displaced workers. So uh, you have a couple of things going on at each of these sites. One is if it's a big energy company, uh, those companies will try to place some of the displaced workers in other facilities in the corporate uh, structure. Um, in addition, at each of the sites, there are statewide programs already in place on job placement and training. But what um, Reggie funds uh, we saw in the case studies were uh, able to do is supplement some of those programs uh, to come in and kind of take a all, all hands on deck sort of um, approach to those. And, um, uh, and so that's a critical role that they play as well. Um, the other two things that we highlight in the report are um, uh, local planning um, uh, assistance. So this is a part that, at least for me, was counterintuitive. And, you know, the old adage, you need to have money to make money um, kind of thing. But what these local communities really need when a coal plant uh, closes, in addition to the lost tax re revenue replacement, is time. And some of them may have staff, um, uh, you know, on uh, in-house that um, are experts in uh, economic development, and some may not. But each of these sites um, requires some planning, and then a local community plan. The successful ones are really driven by local factors. Uh, to figure out what the next phase is, what the next level of, of investments are. And what we found in the case, uh, case studies is uh, some of them found um, one, of the, one of the sites has an, had an expansion of the Sumitomo Tire Factory right adjacent to the um, site that helped to replace a number of jobs. Another site decided the, that they would turn the site into a recreation facility uh, but in the common feature of all these is you need some level of funding to do the local planning, to take the time to line up um, a new round of investments. Reggie funding uh, comes into play in all of these sites um, uh, to help assist with that. Um, the, the Reggie funding essentially provides a little extra time, uh, expertise, and in some instances, uh, investment dollars. The final example is local coal plant community investment funds. I'm going to let Sean talk in a minute about uh, the Trans Alta um, Centralia Washington case study where a Canadian um, energy firm um, made a deal with the governor um, and created a fund, a uh, local investment fund, and the impacts of that um, are pretty dramatic. So um, as Joanne said at the very uh, outset, the choice is pretty binary. Um, when it comes to Reggie, uh, you can either reject Reggie. There are no, our research hasn't disclosed any um, plans at the current coal plant sites in Pennsylvania for what might happen uh, post-closure, um, what investment strategies are. So communities are either looking to be on their own and relying on uh, the market forces that have um, uh, sort of dominated this fast and rapid transition away from coal, or they can adopt Reggie and use some of the um, 
uh, Reggie funding as the governor has uh, proposed in an energy trust fund uh, and advisory board um, to make the kind of reinvestments uh, at the local community and um, really bring back um, uh, jobs and uh, fund a more prosperous uh, future. Um, so uh, the case studies, there's a lot of details in there. I skimmed over uh, a lot of them. Uh, there, each uh, site or each uh, case study is very different. There's no one size fits all, but the common glue, the common thread is uh, having that additional funding uh, allows for planning, site cleanup, um, buys a little time on local tax revenue and can really allow communities to put together a strategic plan that lines up with their um, local and regional investment needs. Um, kudos to uh, the Pennsylvania Department of um, Community Affairs. They do, they do have um, playbooks designed. They got a grant from the Appalachian Regional Commission. So there are there are local um, guidebooks on what to do with closed site, um, but Reggie is really the, um, the funding source that it, if targeted towards these coal plant communities can really have a high impact. And we have a lot to learn from um, what other communities around the country uh, have done, including those uh, from Reggie states. So uh, uh, hopefully that's not too much. Uh, it's a long report. Uh, there's a lot of details in there that I skimmed over, um, but we look forward to answering questions. And so uh, I'm going to ask Sean O'Leary to uh, take the helm now and give us more details uh, from the very exciting um, uh, uh, coal plant site in Washington State, which has the same name as a Pennsylvania town. So there, go ahead. Thank yeah. you, Sean. No, thank you very much, Joe. And Joe, I'd like to thank you and, and all of the people who worked on this report because I'm one of the people in our virtual room who's old enough to remember what happened uh, when this region saw another industrial collapse. And that was, I grew up in Wheeling, West Virginia back in the 1950s and 1960s before when the steel industry was still vibrant and still vital. And in Wheeling, just like in the Mon Valley, we know the effects of what happens when an industry that is that central to a community dies and there is no transition planning and there is no transition funding. And so I regard the work that we're doing in this report and that we're trying to do at the Ohio River Valley Institute as critical to making sure that that doesn't happen again. And I think the good news coming out of this report and out of the research that I've done in the community of Centralia, Washington, is to suggest that there is a model, there is a template that not only can deal with the narrow issue of things like worker retraining, but that can deal with the larger issue of community transition. And so I will be releasing in approximately three weeks, a report that is going to examine the case of a community called Tr Centralia, Washington, which although it is in the Pacific Northwest, looks in most respects, particularly from an economic perspective, like a lot of the communities that we're talking about in Pennsylvania. Um, Centralia is a place that if you go back to 1990, has been a chronically, has had a chronically anemic um, economy. Its unemployment rate has for that 30 year span never been less than two and a half percentage points higher than the national average. And it's also a coal town. It's a town of 18,000 people whose largest employer was a coal mine. Uh, that coal mine has since closed. And its second largest employer is a coal fired power plant the largest um, coal-fired power plant, and also the largest polluter in Washington state. That plant will be completely, is now partially closed, and will be completely co closed by 2025. So in short, we're talking about a town that again, has had a chronically anemic economy, who that was principally reliant, its two largest employers, 
were a coal mine and a coal fired power plant, one of which is closed, taking with it more than 600 jobs. And the second one will close, taking with it another 300 plus jobs. And yet the remarkable thing is this town after years of underperforming has seen a remarkable revival that happens to have coincided with the implementation of a transition plan to which Joe referred when he was making his comments a moment ago. It was a transition plan that is funded by Transalta, the company that owned both the coal mine and that still owns the uh, coal-fired power plant. And at its core was funding of about $55 million that a local community board is investing in a variety of areas. Um, and the areas are ones in which they're heavily oriented toward three items, um, education, energy efficiency, and also um, new energy technologies going into the area. And there are certain qualities that unite these um, investments, and those are that they are investments into industries that are highly labor intensive. Um, you get a lot of people employed for every dollar that's invested. Secondly, the services um, that are being purchased, when I mentioned energy efficiency, are services that are typically performed by local companies, local suppliers. And so the money that's being invested is not only creating a disproportionately large number of jobs, those jobs are far more likely to arise within the local economy. And then finally, the investments that they're making in things like energy efficiency are ones that provide annuity benefits. In addition to the jobs and in addition to the local concentration, these investments are resulting in significantly lowered utility bills for residents, which means more disposable income, which creates more money going into the local economy. And they're also making significant improvements in areas like quality of life and even healthcare costs. And so what we're seeing is an investment strategy in which the effects are way out of proportion to the amount of money being invested. And I'll summarize very quickly what those effects are. Since 2016, when the um, grant funding program went into place, Centralia for the first time in decades saw that its GDP, gross domestic product, started growing at twice the rate of the US economy as a whole. Um, the second thing that happened, and just as importantly, is that job creation all start, also started growing at almost twice the rate of the nation as a whole. And that's a critical thing for those of us in this region to think about, because we know, and, and some of you may be familiar with the report that we issued in February, looking at the effects of the natural gas industry on the region, that that's a case where we've seen huge growth in GDP, huge growth in economic output, but very anemic growth in jobs. In fact, almost no growth in jobs. And so I, while on the one hand, it is possible to have huge GDP growth without seeing growth in income and jobs, um, it is also possible to have those two things go together, which is usually what happens. And that is in fact what's happening in Centralia and what we believe can happen in particularly Southwestern Pennsylvania, where many of the communities Joe was referring to uh, are located. And so we believe that with Centralia, we can come away with a model of investment, um, community investment in industries and in businesses that are labor intensive, local in nature, and that, pre and that produce annuity benefits that can largely offset, or perhaps even in the case of Centralia, exceed the health of the economy that preceded it. And so I'm very optimistic about where we're going with this because the hardest question to answer when I talk and I do often with local policymakers is what's the alternative? 
you know, what, what are we going to do when we don't have the mine or we don't have the steel mill or when, you know, we, the natural gas industry is failing um, to produce jobs. And we're now at a point where we actually have models that can direct us in how to use funding. And I think it's absolutely critical to go back to a point that Joanne Kilgower made, which is we've seen, we know from painful experience what happens when major industries go away and there is no transition plan and no funding. And so I think every legislator in particular who's dealing with this issue has to ask themselves if when they think about Reggie, what is the alternative? If you're not going to support this effort that will provide funding that could potentially produce Centralia-like results, then what are you going to do for these communities? Because right now there is no other train. This may be the last one leaving the station. So again, thank you to Joe for this report. I hope you'll look forward to the report that we'll have coming out in a few weeks about Centralia and a model for what we think can be economic renewal for the region and coal towns and elsewhere. And with that, I'll hand it back to Joanne. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Sean. So we started out with Joe's overview of the report, and now we've heard from Sean about this specific case study. And now I'd like to turn it over to Franz Litz um, to share with us a broader perspective on Reggie and some um, track records for other states where we do have concrete experience of how they've navigated Reggie and, and what opportunities have been created. So Franz, with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to you and then we'll get to the questions that we've already started seeing in the chat. Okay, great. I'll keep it brief so we can get to questions. Uh, as Joanne says, I'm Franz Litz. I've been involved in Reggie since the beginning, initially from a post in New York State when I led New York's effort to get Reggie up and running, which you may know, um, or, or maybe you don't. Reggie was started by a Republican governor, George Pataki, and the initial nine governors who signed up for discussions, of those six were Republican, three were Democrats. So this was, this was Pataki's original idea. And they thought it was a reasonable way to go about reducing pollution while also having a way to invest uh, in things like the focus of this report. Uh, I just want, also wanna note that more recently, I've been working with state officials in Virginia to help Virginia join Reggie. And I'm presently active in North Carolina where an effort to join Reggie is moving through the early stages of their regulatory process. So um, this is a program that's attracting followers um, at a pretty rapid clip in recently. I wanna commend Joe and the other authors, authors of the report for pointing out a key opportunity when it comes to Pennsylvania's participation in Reggie early next year. Reggie has a 12 year track record. Um, and I think that's what's attracting these other states. I'd be happy to take any questions you may have about those other states and why they're attracted. Um, if you have been following Reggie, you've probably heard a lot about the energy efficiency investments and the renewable energy investments. That's what we hear about the most. And they are important, but this new report really helpfully points out that New York and Massachusetts have used Reggie proceeds to help out communities with coal plants that have retired. And as you probably know, we are seeing this all across the country. The same thing we're seeing here in Pennsylvania. Coal plants cannot compete against cheap natural gas and renewables, and they're retiring, and they're leaving communities that could use some help. As Sean has, has uh, uh, pointed out and is spending his time and effort to, to help in the Centralia case. Participation in Reggie would provide a great source of funding to help out these communities where coal plants are struggling and it appears they will inevitably be forced out by that lower cost natural gas and lower cost renewables. So um, I'll stop there. I wanna thank the Ohio River Valley Institute and Joe and the other author authors. This is a great new report. Investments in communities that are going to lose coal plants with or without Reggie represent a key opportunity for Pennsylvania when it joins Reggie next year. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone again for joining us. We have a couple questions in the Q&A, which I'll start fielding now. And for others, feel free to type your questions and we'll get to those as well. Um, so for our panel, the first question comes from Paul Goff from the Pittsburgh Business Times. Um, and Paul asks, you're describing the things that can be done in coal plant communities, 
But what about communities like Green, Washington, and Armstrong counties in Pennsylvania that have coal mines and are suppliers to plants? And what does the research say about what can done what can be done to support communities that might be mining communities and not necessarily coal plant communities? Well, this is Sean. Um, Paul, one of the beauties of the model that I suggested is being created in Centralia, Washington, and the kinds of investments that are being made there are two things. First of all, the investments are being made on a scale that is imaginable that the that kind of money can flow into counties like Green and Washington and Armstrong. And secondly, the kinds of investments that are being made are ones that can be made in those counties. The fact that you know they're the home of communities with mines and not necessarily power plants, or at least not anymore. We know, you know, Washington certainly lost a major power plant a few years ago. Um, but these are the kinds of investments that can be made in any community. The, the trick isn't that they're unique or specific to one community. It's that these are simply investments that, as I said before, are highly labor intensive, are very local in nature in terms of who the businesses are that are engaged in um, getting the funds. And then finally, they do, they do provide annuity benefits that help enrich the larger economy. And that's in, as true in um, Washington or Greene County as it would have or would be or would have been in Beaver County where they also lost a major coal-fired power plant. Yeah, um, uh, Sean, thanks. I, I agree 100% with that. And one of the things that we tried to, you know, keep the focus on in this report was um, uh, coal plant um, community, uh, uh, coal communities where coal plants are closed. But as Sean points out, um, the same lessons uh, learned could really be applied um, to um, uh, coal communities uh, throughout the state, um, you know, if, if it's supply chain or coal um, uh, mining. And one of the case studies and um, uh, one of the things I would encourage you to take a look at is the, you know, the Colorado um, legislation that created the advisory um, uh, commission it looked at this um, whole issue in a, that broader scope that you raise. You know, how does it affect supply chain, mining, everything, um, uh, coal plants in general? And so their recommendations uh, really track some of the same things that we found in um, in the six uh, Reggie State um, case studies. The difference in Colorado is they're asking the legislature for $100 million to implement their plan. Uh, they don't have funding um, and they recognize the really critical importance of funding in all these communities. Um, and they have great recommendations. They had participation from uh, labor, uh, businesses, uh, elected officials, local officials. Um, but what they were missing is that glue that we referred to in the case studies, this additional funding. So um, same principles as apply. I agree with what Sean said. It could be used in um, any coal impacted uh, community in Pennsylvania. Um, and it's one of the reasons why um, the trust fund that's proposed by uh, the, the Wolf administration and that advisory committee is a really important piece of this puzzle. Um, how to uh, dedicate these funds moving forward. Thanks, Joy. Thank you, Joe. Um, I'm gonna try to combine the next two questions because I think they go well together, but Joe, these are directed at you. Um, and one was just to briefly review the, the, either, the kinds of um, things that Reggie funds could be used for that you described in your overview. And then Rachel McDevitt asked, what recommendations you have for how Pennsylvania can most effectively spend Reggie funds. So maybe just taking those two together and responding to sort of the categories that you looked at and then what recommendations coming out of that that you would have for Pennsylvania. Always helps to take your mute button off. Um, great, it's a great question. And uh, hopefully the report 
um, you know, uh, plays this out. One thing I just want to emphasize is each of these sites is very different. Um, and then what the local community decides to do moving forward in, in you know, when, when confronted with a closed coal plant is very different. One of the sites, um, they retrofitted uh, the site and turned it into a park or they're, they're, they, they don't want an energy or industrial facility, they want a recreational center. Um, other sites, um, part of the site uh, became a natural gas plant and another part will be an industrial park. Uh, I mentioned uh, a local employer, Sumitomo Tire, decided when the site was fixed up, they would expand their own facility adjacent to it. Each of those plans, you know, one to go with a uh, natural gas site, uh, one to uh, find an existing employer who wanted to expand, and one to just turn the site into a park, um, were locally driven. So what the Reggie funding in the six categories that we found of the best practices in general, if I had to give it a super broad brush, it basically buys the local community and business leaders and labor leaders and um, displaced workers time to find uh, new job opportunities, uh, hopefully with the same skill sets that um, were required at the old job, um, but really line up the next steps. So those uh, as they're described in the um, uh, in the report are, uh, number one, uh, job placement and job training. Every state has, including Pennsylvania, has um, state and federal funds available for job training and uh, workforce development. Um, one thing that the Reggie states have done is kind of put together, you know, an all hands on deck kind of SWAT team to come in and uh, highlight the, the, the skill set of the displaced workers um, and really try to find them uh, other local jobs, and if not other local jobs, other jobs around the state. So that supplemental job training money um, gives a lot of flexibility and can pull in a lot of expertise that already exists. Um, the second is kind of the immediate crisis management, you know, the loss of those uh, tax revenues that um, are paid by the local plant. Oftentimes they go down to zero right away uh, and what you don't want to do is be faced with the decision to lay off, um, um, you know, uh, critical uh, local workers like police, fire, and and teachers. That's not the kind of community that new investors want to come to. So that uh, replacing the lost tax revenues is a critical part. Every one of these sites has some kind of site redevelopment. Um, if there's a private owner who's redeveloping, that's great. Oftentimes there there isn't. Uh, and the township is left with, um, you know, a site that they've got to prepare and reuse. And there may be some existing state or federal funds that are available. Um, uh, but uh, Reggie funds in Massachusetts and New York have been used for site cleanup, site redevelopment. And that's a critical part of uh, attracting new investors and creating new jobs. And then um, fourth and fifth are kind of related. Um, that seed funding money, um, there are some terrific uh, federal programs on manufacturing um, investments. Um, uh, the power program from the Appalachian Regional Commission, um, uh, job training, uh, brownfield site development. There, there's, a, there's a whole, and they're described in the report, they're all um, really effective programs. But what they require is some local planning, uh, grant pr preparation, um, and some seed, mo seed money. And in the Reggie sites in New York and Massachusetts, um, the Reggie funding was able to um, provide a little bit of time with the uh, lost tax revenue replacement, but at the same time, some, some funding for the ability for local planning to kind of take hold and line up new investors uh, line up, figure out what other folks in the region are doing, what the state incentives might be for investment. Uh, that takes time, it takes a little bit of expertise and Reggie funding can um, help local communities kind of sort through that. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and then the last is what uh, Sean was talking about happened in, um, uh, in Centralia and Washington uh, state. Um, 
you know, it's a, it was a private source there, but it could be a combination of public private. It was a direct investment in energy efficiency jobs uh, in Centralia. And it, as Sean's uh, data in the report show, it had a dramatic impact on economic development and recovery in Centralia for the four years that those funds were deployed. So um, all those strategies, you know, there are different pieces of this puzzle. It's not a one size fits all uh, local communities, um, you know, uh, without Reggie would be sort of on their own to figure this out with Reggie, they'll at least have time, um, resources and the ability to sort through some of these problems in um, in a way similar that, that we've at least seen in the case studies. Thanks, Joe. Um, we have one final question. Oh, and then, uh, sorry, I just saw a question come in from Rachel McDevitt, um, which is, how do your findings in this report line up with the Wolf administration's proposal for how to, how to um, spend Reggie funds? And um, so, Joe, I don't know if you or Franz would like to respond to that, um, but feel free to get us started. So I, I'll let uh, Franz fill in some of the blanks. I, I can tell you the, um, what the report does is it looked at um, Governor Wolf's budget and brief proposal that he put in this year's um, budget. And in that he described different buckets of investment. Um, and those buckets um, line up well with uh, what we saw uh, in Reggie funding in other states. Um, and so one of the buckets and, and the, the dollar amounts involved will be determined, uh, I think, by um, the General Assembly in Pennsylvania and uh, by the administration. Um, so uh, uh, and that'll probably change over time. But uh, the proposal from the Wolf administration is set up at least uh, a significant portion of the funds for local and community, um, coal community investments is a, a critical piece that we saw in the case studies. It's an important piece of uh, the administration's proposal. And uh, if anybody was asking our opinion uh, based on the case study research, uh, it's really a critical piece, uh, piece of the puzzle. It, it's not the, the whole area of how the Wolf administration has proposed using some of these Reggie funds, but it, it's a really, it's a significant portion. There's a identified advisory board um, set up and, and that would seem to be a critical piece of this puzzle. Thank you. Franz, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I would just add that the board that the administration proposal proposes, it's pretty common. A lot of the other states that invest Reggie funds, they go, they, they put together boards and review potential investments. And in this context, I think especially with the coal communities, um, it's really, it'll, I'll, I'll just emphasize it's really important that people from those communities be brought in and, you know, they're in the best position to, to know what's, uh, what's right for those communities. So um, that's what's nice about the board. It, it pro provides a setup for, for the communities to have a direct say. You know, Joanne, I just wanted to make one other thing because it relates to what Franz said and then what Sean was talking about earlier. Um, Pennsylvania, if you look at, um, you know, the, the fastest growing area in clean energy um, is energy efficiency. It's a uh, it's a win win. Um, it's a growing industry. But when you look at Pennsylvania, um, it has a lot of area of potential for growth. Um, Pennsylvania ranks 41st. Uh, amongst all the states in uh, energy efficiency jobs per capita. So one of the things that, um, you know, France has seen in other um, Reggie states are direct investments in energy efficiency. Um, Pennsylvania has a lot of room to grow. There's a lot of industry leaders that are already located in Pennsylvania, but uh, additional investments in energy efficiency translate into jobs. And that's one of the things that um, I think the other Reggie states have seen um, from Reggie funding investments. Having yeah. said that, this report really focuses on local investments, uh, how they've been handled in other states and, and the impacts that they've had. 
Yeah, if I could, I would just like to second the point that Joe made, because, you know, in Pennsylvania, uh, especially since the beginning of the natural gas boom, there's been a lot of rhetoric about how cheap natural gas has reduced the utility bills in Pennsylvania. But the fact is that Pennsylvania's average monthly utility bills, electric bills, have actually been rising faster than the national average for the last decade. And that's in large part because of the point that Joe made just a moment ago. And that is that Pennsylvania has an immense opportunity to improve energy efficiency throughout. And it's because, you know, we're talking about oftentimes many communities that are older, have older building stock and have great potential for making improvements. Um, and so, and of course, as Joe pointed out also, energy efficiency is one of those kinds of investments that has multiple benefits. It's very jobs intensive as you pointed out, but it also creates the new annuity benefit of reduced utility bills going on, which injects more money into the economy and it produ pro improves quality of life as well. And so, you know, though, those are the qualities that we're looking for in any kind of investment that it not only creates jobs, but provides annuity benefits and improves quality of life. If you're hitting on all of those cylinders, then you probably have a pretty good investment and a pretty good opportunity to succeed. Thank you, Sean. The, uh, the final two cents and then I'll, I'll pipe down. Uh, Maryland is right next door to Pennsylvania. Half the population of Pennsylvania, roughly, it has the same number of energy efficiency jobs. So it's totally, you know, half the population, same number of jobs. So their, their energy efficiency job rate is about twice uh, Pennsylvania's same housing stock. A lot of Pennsylvania contractors go down to work in Maryland. So it's, um, it's an industry that could, you know, definitely expand and grow and uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, as uh, Franz highlighted, in a lot of the Reggie states, those investments have been made and they've translated into jobs in those states. Thank you. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. And that question gets into more of the process around some of the community engagement. So um, to any of the panelists, could you talk in a little more specificity about the local strategies that were employed in other states and who particularly was engaged, um, for example, organized labor or other community stakeholders? Sure, uh, I'm happy to take the first crack at that. Um, it, uh, the, the, what, one thing you'll take away from the case studies is uh, each of these communities is different. Um, a, great example of a local community uh, planning effort was the Huntley uh, plant in New York uh, that's in uh, uh, Tonawanda and um, uh, a lot of stakeholders involved with that. They put out a report, it, the links are in our report um, so you can get a good feel for it. But it, in that work group was the Western Federation Western New York Federation of Labor. Um, they were a big uh, participant in that. Um, uh, another example of planning at the Salem Harbor site was um, a particular interest to the governor. The governor created a task force. Um, part of that, a lot of stakeholders in that uh, task force, they put together an initial um, set of recommendations that led to um, some private investment and then the separation of 40 acres on the site for additional investment. Um, and there was labor participation at the Salem Harbor site. Um, I think it was IBEW 326, but um, there were others. Um, the Colorado example, the, their stakeholder, I, it, Colorado's advisory board is kind of the Cadillac of these planning processes. Um, it, it, they really pulled together a diverse group. They had a statute, they had time, um, time pressures, but They've gotten out recommendations, and uh, I know the AFL-CIO uh, state director was a co-chair of that, and IBEW Local um, 111 in Colorado was part of that. Um, so each of these sites are, are different, um, uh, but uh, labor has played a critical role in um, uh, at planning in uh, some of these sites. Um, 
and uh, uh, there's no reason why uh, that shouldn't be the case. Um, I mean, it, it, it's a good example for Pennsylvania to be able to follow. Great, thank you so much. Um, would either of our other panelists like to make any final comments? Sure, uh, Joanne, um, I, I just wanna thank Joe and the, and the report authors. This is a great report. It, it really highlights an aspect of investing Reggie proceeds that is not talked about enough. You know, even those examples from New York, New York doesn't could, really should be trumpeting those uh, successful examples, um, but they don't. So thank you, Joe, for bringing these to our attention and, and really showing how, how it can be done, how you can use proceeds to help these communities. And I'd just like to join Franz in, in thanking Joe and the folks who worked on this report, because as I said, we know what it looks like when industries are allowed to evaporate in communities that depend on them. And this is an opportunity to avoid that fate again and do something about it. And I, I sincerely hope that state legislators in Pennsylvania will take advantage of that opportunity. Great. Many thanks to all of our panelists and thanks to everyone who was able to join and for these excellent questions. We had a great discussion today and the report is live. So should anyone have more detailed questions, feel free to consult the report. And I'm sure any of us would be happy to be available offline to go into any more detail. Excellent, thank you, Joanne.